Hello, this is Stormtrooper 1. In case you were just way too busy to listen to our last show, this is what you missed. They're going back to that spiritual ele- spiritual element with the Force that, honestly, that's what gave me the chills back in the day with Empire Strikes Back. Yoda talking about all the spiritual elements of the Force. So, you know, talking about the forces everywhere. It's in that rock, in that tree. Yeah. It's around you. It's around me. It's in your penis. <laughs> it's in your penis. Use now it. release it. You all oh, <laughs> use it on Jen Asso. <laughs> Execute Order 66 on her Asso. Go into her dark cave. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> your blaster, you will not need. <laughs> What's inside? Whatever you take. Whatever you take. <laughs> Luke confronts a big old penis. <laughs> oh, that's I, we just lost all credibility <laughs> once again. Warning from the back to tank contains adult language and discussions. If you're easily offended, do not continue. We would be honored if you would join us. How are you feeling? Your latest workups on your condition indicate that all damage has been reversed. Recovery is total. I believe you have been quite fortunate. No further thanks are necessary, Commander, but you are most welcome. It is my function and pleasure as a matter of royal to help and heal human beings. I am a Jedi, like my father before me. All right, hello everybody, welcome back. Star Wars from the Back to Tank. If you miss any part of this broadcast, you can always find us on Stitcher and iTunes. Just search Star Wars from the Back to Tank. Also, the Rain Man Digital app. You can take this show as well as the rest of the network on the go anywhere you want to go. All Even right. into a dark cave. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> Let's Don't not start. go there again. Don't start. Um, all right. So, Emil- Am- Amelia, right? Amelia Clark. Yes. Joins the Han Solo standalone film. Uh, I think that's probably the biggest piece of news that we have for the week. And see you later, everybody. <laughs> that's it. No. All right. So if you guys don't know who Amelia Clark is, she is the uh, actress from uh, most known for Game of Thrones and also second known the most for destroying the Terminator franchise. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't blame uh, her, but I blame the writers. But uh, anyways, I, but she's part of the problem as well. Uh, she's fantastic in Game of Thrones. Oh, she's awesome. Fantastic in Game of Thrones. So I'm looking forward to seeing what she does outside of being fantastic in Game of Thrones and being terrible in Terminator. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm hoping somewhere we can go somewhere in the middle. In the middle? Middle. Yeah. yeah. Please don't go back to Terminator. We don't want to see another badly done Arnold CGI fight. Yeah. So she joins the cast of Han Solo's standalone film. Amelia Clark is heading to a galaxy far, far away, according to Star Wars Dot com and she's going to meet Han and Chewie. Star Wars.com is excited to announce that Clark, known for her stirring betrayal as uh, Daenerys Targaryen, Targaryen in the Game of Thrones, will join the upcoming untitled Han Solo movie. Uh, Clark's role will round out a dynamic cast of characters that Han and Chewie will encounter on their adventures. Uh, Clark joins, as we know, uh, Alden Enrich. As and Donald Glover, previously cast as Han Solo and Lando Carusian, uh, in the highly anticipated film, which is set to, which is set prior to the original Star Wars trilogy. Uh, the untitled movie is helmed by directors Phil Lord and Christopher Miller, and is set to release in 2018. So that's just about a year and a half away. Yes, it's gonna be after Episode Eight. Yeah, because they they do Rogue One. the The game is. They do a side story, then it's the main story, then it's a side story again. Yeah. So after Han Solo will be episode nine. So we got three cast members now on board the show, which is kind of surprising. We have not heard more taking into the account that the the release is 
a year and a half away. Yeah. And is uh, this is this the slowest casting we've seen in in Star Wars so far? They're being really really you know, you think they're not just careful. Re- you think they're not releasing it? Is that what it is? Yeah, I think they're being really careful with this one because honestly, dude, uh, Rogue One, they could do whatever they want because there was nothing really that could harm them, you know, product-wise that would damage the product. Rogue One couldn't damage the product. Right. On Solo, the fan film, or I'm calling the it a fan, fan film. film. Han Solo, That's the, the problem right there. Yeah. The Han Solo film, <laughs> that could turn bad. Because think about it. Yeah, if fans, I, I agree, if fans hate that movie. I agree. That's going to damage the product big time. Because I'm not, I'm not, uh, it's hard. Because Rogue One, you're casting new, uh, you're not casting new actors to play old roles. Yes. There's always that thing that you got to get through when you're reca- when you're kind of rebooting. Uh, this isn't a reboot, but they are rebooting a character in the sense that they are recasting him. And obviously Harrison Ford can't play the young Han Solo. Uh, and they have if they want to delve into the Han Solo territory, then yes, they're going to have to recast it. And I think all of us have been it's kind of like a I think many fans are like, "Yes, we want to see this." Ooh, no we no, yes, we don't we want to yeah. see this. Ooh, no, we don't. We're nervous because Han Solo is an iconic character. One of the most iconic characters in pop culture today, without a doubt. And you're recasting him with an unknown. And I'm not saying someone else can't play him, but how do we do this? Do we want to see someone playing Harrison Ford as Han Solo? Or do we want someone playing Han Solo? Like, where do you go with that? It goes in the same line of thinking as Superman. Do we want to see the actor that we recast play Christopher Reeves as Superman? Or do we want to see him play his own version of Superman? Yeah. And honestly, with a role like this, Dave, I have to say that this actor has to play Harrison Ford as Han Solo. You think? Because I, do, do we want to see a new portrayal of Han Solo? That's the thing. Is like every time anybody tries to do the same type of character, cr- cr- it uh, falls flat uh, no, on its face. Nope. Nope. I disagree. Carl Urban as Doctor McCoy is amazing. He plays Doc DeForest Kelly like a pro. Uh, yeah, dude. Don't yeah. even at me. He's amazing as playing DeForest. He's playing DeForest Kelly, not Dr. McCoy. He's playing DeForest Kelly as Dr. McCoy. McCoy. And I think if you play, and even Chris Pine has done pretty good, at least in the first movie, he played his, he played Kirk more William Shatner ish. Now, since he's, it's his own role now, he's kind of, he's kind of got away from that. But at the beginning, I think he needed to be almost William Shatner. And the same thing with this role. I think in order for people to be okay, we want to see those Han, those Harrison Ford, Harrison Ford, yes, that is Han Solo. Yeah, I, I, I get it, but the thing you is, you gotta be scruffy looking and a nerd herder. <laughs> the thing is, <laughs> when when they try to do it, it all it for me, majority of the time, it, it falls flat. I agree, but that's why this actor has to be good because he has to be able to play Harrison Ford as Han Solo. Otherwise, people are like, "This is Han Solo." Now, now I do like the fact that uh, Alden Eidenreich is relatively unknown. So, right. That is a bonus <laughs> because right, you don't want to put a famous actor yeah. in this role because then they're going to be when they talked about like, who was it that, uh, oh my God, I forgot don't his name. Tell me. I already know Chris Pratt. Yeah. When as they Indiana talked Jones. As Chris, no, Chris Pratt is Han Solo. Oh, there was, was that it? talk that he was going to do it. After and Jurassic we, I was like going, no, yeah. no. After, um, what's that movie? Guardians of the galaxy. Yeah. Chris Pratt was going to play every role according to the internet. Yeah. So who knows if that was even true, but yeah, I wouldn't want Chris Pratt to play anybody. I don't want anybody famous playing these roles. No. You got to cast unknowns if you're recasting because we want to see them playing the person that we know. And I know that's probably debatable. I know there's a lot of Star Wars fans listening right now. Like, no, we don't want him copying. I'm like, but you know what? Are you going to want to see some guy with a jacket on and a vest and he's just like some other character? It doesn't even feel like Han Solo. No, yeah. you're going to be upset, right? David, you're telling me you, okay, if you go to watch a Han Solo movie and you see this guy who's not Han Solo, except by name, except by name. you're telling me you're going to be okay with it. Part of me feels like I'd be okay with it because this is a young Han Solo. Okay, David, let's take you, let's go in the way back time machine again, the way back machine. Once again, we've been doing this three shows in a row now. Okay. And let's go back to little David. 
<laughs> Little be, David between, would be crying. Between, you know, between <laughs> taking breaks of whacking it to Pamela Anderson on Baywatch and Princess Leia on Star Wars, yeah. you uh, pretty much acted the same way. Your personality didn't change. Like, yes, we grow as individuals. That's not what I'm saying. But your mannerisms, your personality, it's still David Sabal. Flash forward now to David in his 30s, and you're still David. You're still going to, if someone didn't fully recognize you that you went to high school with, and they started talking to you like, oh, it's David Sabal, I can tell. By the way he talks, that's half the, that's how you recognize people sometimes, is their mannerisms and their gestures, and the way they say things. So if you get a character in there to play Han Solo, and it's not Han Solo, People are gonna be yeah. people are gonna be put off, man. They're they're gonna be put off. But that's what that goes in line with why I'm saying this is probably why they're taking so much. Yeah. Really being really careful, yeah. and, and that's probably and they didn't even announce who she's playing. So it's like I just Princess read, Leia. So oh, that'd be so hilarious, <laughs> terrible. <laughs> but like they they haven't even uh, uh, said who she's playing. So it's kind of like they're really really making sure to be really secretive about this project. Because usually by this time we would have known. Yeah. And you know, I'm not saying I want him to mimic every Harrison Ford thing and make it feel like it's a fan, fan service either. Like your guy's fan service. He's going to do uh, I have a bad feeling about this and all the famous Harrison Ford lines. Like we're not going to do that either. Yeah. Don't make it a caricature, but just make sure we, we see in mannerisms and style. The way he walks. The yeah, way and he kind of like carries himself. Yeah, that's all I'm saying. I, I, like, I want him to make sure he studies Harrison Ford as well. Not just Han Solo, but the actor needs to sit there and look at the Harrison Ford and his, and his mannerisms to make sure he can sell us on the Han Solo we know. Yeah. You like, know? So, I, and, and this isn't going to be Han Solo from thir- when he's 15, dude. You got to remember, New Hope Han Solo was, was in his 30s. So how far... So even younger, because going with your line of thinking, well, he's younger, so it's okay if he acts a little different. I'm like, okay, so how much younger is he going to be? 23? 24? Uh, he's not going to be that much younger than he was when we met him in New Hope. True. True. So, uh, I mean, dude, there's, there's a lot going on with this movie that I, I have confidence in this movie. I'm not saying I don't, but even Daniel, Donald Glover's Lando, dude, come on. <laughs> I mean, I, and I'm being a little Star Wars bitch fanboy right now, but even I'm not sold on that either. I mean, dude, Billy D. Williams is badass brother, man. And you get Donald Glover, and if you've seen him and stuff, he's skinny and he's little. He looks like a little like rapper crackhead. He's like, yeah. hey, hey, guys. Yeah. It, it, he just he I mean. doesn't it's look like, like he doesn't badass look like, Billy D. Williams. That's why that's why I'm like going, I'm Who really is black brother in the galaxy. The only black brother. Except for Finn. <laughs> I don't know. I just think Donald Glover looks like a skinny guy, like a skinny little kind of a twerp almost. No, you you have a very very valid point. He's in a show right now called Atlanta. I think on Showtime. I think it's called Atlanta. And I was watching it just to see how he is. And he just, dude. I know he, he's a good actor. He's not a bad actor, but man, he is so little. He's he's he is so little. And his I'm like, physique does not speak like a young Lando. Yeah. And like I'm like going. The only, as sad as it sounds, I'm like, are they going to give him the mustache? Because that's probably the only saving grace. So you don't, so out of all things, <laughs> that's your biggest thing as a Star Wars fan. He's got to have that mustache. He's got to have the mustache. He has the porn stash. Okay. We, he might salvage oh, this. Oh, my God. All right. Let's move into a little bit more Harrison Ford news. Um, well, Harrison Ford related news. And I, and I usually don't cover this type of things, but I think it's kind of important just because, you know, we're fully <laughs> invested in Star Wars news. But Recently, a few days ago, Carrie Fisher lit the entire internet on fire and then threw it away. <laughs> threw uh, it away. I mean, dude, everybody was talking about this. That Carrie Fisher, I guess, in her lead- latest, I guess, di- book book release, has um, officially announced that I, I guess her and Harrison Ford were in fact having an affair on the set of Star Wars: New Hope. I mean, first off, did anyone ever think differently? Not really. I mean, I just kind of, yes, I wasn't even born in ni- when they were shooting this in what, 1976 when they were shooting it? Yeah. 1975. I wasn't even alive, but I mean, when I grew up and, and I was watching these movies in the 80s and 90s, I just always assumed. I'm like, just made sense. Why, like, look how touchy touchy she is. Yeah. I think she likes them. Yeah. That's uh, more than just acting. And you know what, man? Uh, I, I actually talked about this with my uh, girlfriend last night, and she was actually kind of surprised by it. But I, like, I told her, you got to understand, too. I mean, like, they they were working together for how long? 
Yeah. I mean, it t- how many how many years how did it many take years to shoot this take movie? To shoot not just the movie, yeah. but the whole trilogy. Yeah, man, exactly. It, like almost ten years of their life, and and, yeah. and and those of you that aren't in the movie business or haven't shot a movie, um, you become. Why do you think relationships don't work in Hollywood yeah. most of the time? Because not because all these Hollywood guys are and girls are deviants. It's because unfortunately a lot of us, it's very hard for many of us to separate certain things. And when you're living your life day in, day out, really close with other people and you become a family for half of a year, sometimes a full year to shoot some of these big movies, you become invested emotionally with these people. They become your best friends. They become your lovers. It's just a thing that happens. That's why relationships relationships don't work a lot of times in Hollywood because yeah. of that. And you got to remember, I mean, a clear cut example out of Star Wars, Lord of the Rings, that cast became like a family. If you yeah. watch the behind the scenes, they literally yeah. became a family. Now, Samwise and Frodo were actually having an affair on set <laughs> <laughs> as Frodo and Samwise. And though. Samwise. Yeah. And like... Honestly, if you watch like movies like that, where they have like a trilogy going and basically I'm sure even like with the, some of the superhero movies nowadays, it's same with the Avengers cast They're They've worked for so long. It almost becomes kind of like a family situation. Yeah. And when something big happens, like a recasting or anything, it's a big deal to a couple of the cast members. So, I mean, when, I, I, all I'm saying is I always thought it was implied, David, when he said that ain't no cave. I just thought we, I, I thought <laughs> I thought he was getting meta. I thought, yeah, when the audience is queuing yeah. us in, and then later on, you know, we we kind of understand. You saw that. that look when he said that with her, and he, she grabs his arm. He's all, it's closing. <laughs> I, I thought it was just implied. <laughs> it, it was just subtlety. Yeah. All right, let's move on from this gossip shit. All right, so details on... This is a little bit of spoiler information here, Dave. I'm warning you, as well as listeners who may not know, want to know spoiler information. You may want to tune out for about five minutes or so. But it's not anything that's going to ruin the plot. It's just little kind of previews into into Vader's appearance and why he appeared. Uh, Why he actually makes an appearance in this movie, at least in the scene that we saw in the most recent trailers that was released. Uh, Details on the scene between Darth Vader and Orson Krennic uh, from Rogue One, according to StarWarsNet.com. On Friday, they posted an article about Darth Vader's return in Rogue One, where they included an interesting interesting bit of information about Vader's scene with Orson Krennic. And that guy is uh, as... At least the information that we have that we have that has been released is the main villain antagonist of Rogue One. Uh, let's see. The article was uh, posted at the same time as the Catalyst review and the story got a bit buried in all the Vader talk. Uh, so they decided to post it here. Apparently with uh, let's see the central villain and chief antagonist in the film is Orson Krennic's character along with several other militaristic members of the Empire who eventually witnessed the firepower of the Death Star. Uh, the Empire is filled with backstabbing leaders who conspire to move through the ranks. I like that. Makes sense. And it also ties right into one of the new canon books, uh, uh, A New Dawn. Yes. Where you actually see that in the story, that they all are backstabbing and trying to get one leg up on each other. Oh, it's on, on, even in Tarkin, in the novel Tarkin. Yeah. Tarkin knows that basically a lot of his commanders, he can't trust. And that's one of the really, really cool things about that book is you get to see that even the most highest ranked people do not trust the low rank officials that are their right hand man. Yeah. And it, it, it makes sense that basically, yeah, Krennic is probably one of those officers that's trying to get above the ranks. Because the closer you are to the Emperor, the more power you have. Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, producer John Noel brought this up at the celebration, saying there's a lot of pa- uh, palace intrigue going on in the Empire, he said, with people conspiring to move up the ranks and sabotaging each other. There's not a lo- there is not a lot of... Not, oh, my God. <laughs> there's there's not, not a lot of loyalty there. Uh, this should make you happy because I know that you like political intrigue. Oh, yeah. That is, this is yeah. straight up political intrigue. Yeah, man. Uh, it's, that's, actually, that's exactly what I was thinking when I was reading this. Uh, our source is telling us that the reason Vader shows up in Rogue One for the pivotal, pivotal scene that Kathleen Kennedy talked about earlier in the year is to confront the director. The scene involves Vader and Imperial Director Krennic having a heated exchange shortly before the Death Star fires upon 
the holy city of Jetta. He meets with Krennic to discuss the reason why they shouldn't force their hand until the right time. At this point, we're not sure whether or not the Emperor sent Vader, although it's highly likely that it is the case. It seems that Krennic goes against the warning and eventually it leads to his own downfall. Uh, for the most part, this part seems to match up with what director uh, Gareth Edwards said in an interview with USA Today a couple months ago. Uh, Krennic hits a brick wall in the hierarchy where they won't let him in the club and it's going to turn uh, into a them or us situation, either Krennic or Tarkin and the others, Edwards said. Oh, I love it. Yeah, it's awesome. And, and what honestly, a way to tell a story so that you do. Oh, my God, that's so good. So that for those people that are kind of. Uh, man, we've been debating about how do you not tie in the rest of the Empire into the story? Well, there you go. Yeah. Um, yes, we want Vader in it, and I hope he has a much bigger role than this. I yeah. hope he's there to kind of keep him in line a bit as kind of like, hey, I'm not here to take over the reins, but I'm going to keep you in line and make sure you don't do anything that's going to prevent the Empire from achieving its ultimate goal. Ultimate goal. Which, is, which we know is surprise. They, didn't, they don't, at this point, if you want to believe everything we've learned so far, that the, you know, the Death Star is supposed to have been remained a secret. A secret. And also, you got to remember, the Senate has not been dissolved at this point. It's only in New Hope yes, where you exactly. actually find out, oh, the Emperor dissolved the Senate at that point. But before this, the Senate's still there. So imagine if they found out, oh, the Empire built this literally doomsday weapon. Yeah, and same thing with the, with the fact that the Death Star is now operational and Tarkin f picks a, a target as we saw so all of that's going to have to lead into the fact that why you know they're going to have to kind of I see how Vader and the Emperor if that's the way they're going is going to want to do this at the right moment now, now here's the thing the one thing that was really interesting about this article it talks about the book the catalyst yeah the other point that they point that that get, gets kind of glossed over is the fact that you find out in the catalyst what powers the Death Star and what powers the Death Star is a kyber crystal. And that's interesting. And kyber crystals are very important to the and, Force. And why? Because they actually are what powers the lightsaber. Which, now, by, which by the way, Dave, we didn't talk about this um, last week since you brought up kyber crystal. Um, you know, that's allegedly why people think um, Jen Ursel is Force sensitive. Because in the trailer, her mother hands her a necklace a crystal. with a crystal on, crystal on it that looks a lot like kyber crystal. Yeah. And here's the thing. The thing I, I, I found really interesting about reading more into this article was the fact that not only... So Vader finds out that the Death Star is powered by a kyber crystal. Down deep inside, he's still Anakin Skywalker, the Force user, a believer in the Force. Because remember... In New Hope, he tells everyone this this Death Star pales in comparison to the power of the Force. So he believes more in the Force than the Death Star. Now, finding out that one of your religious relics that you believe in is being used for this Doomsday weapon would probably anger Darth Vader, and that's probably why Darth Vader does not look highly upon the Death Star. He doesn't believe in it. Because remember, in New Hope, he, tells, he even tells Tarkin that basically... You know, this, this Death Star pales in comparison to the power that you could have. And you know what? That makes a lot more sense, too. The fact that there's a weapon, it makes it that... Tell me it doesn't make the Death Star that much more interesting when you find out. If this is, in fact, the case, uh, if we want to believe everything... Yeah, we, I guess we can. Catalyst is The uh, Catalyst, the is, Catalyst canon. Actually, Catalyst is canon, and basically the, in the Catalyst you find out that basically the Death Star is powered by a kyber crystal. Yeah, and, and doesn't it make it that much more interesting, the Death Star? Rather than being a giant monstrosity of technology, it would make sense that Palpatine would create an... Uh, uh, Not Palpatine. Remember, Palpatine didn't create it. It was his idea. It was his idea, but uh, the person that actually came, that, that literally uh, would develop the uh, Death Star is Jin's father. Right, but I'm saying that it would make sense because they had the plans before, I'm assuming. Unless yes. Jen Ursel's father is way before even into Revenge of the Sith. But the plans of the Death Star, we saw them in Revenge of the Sith. I'm, yes. I'm assuming that all of this timeline stuff will be fixed with... Uh, with Rogue One. With, right, with the release of the information in Catalyst, which came out November 15th, just a few days ago. And then, of course, Rogue One. I'm, I'm assuming very, very soon here we'll get a clear look at the timeline and when the Death Star was officially created or yeah. came up with. Um, but anyways, what I'm saying is that it would make sense that Palpatine would want to use a weapon that was 
fueled by the force. force. Wouldn't yes. that make sense? It would make sense. That's cool. I'm I'm 100% okay with that reimagining. And and dude, how cool is that? That's probably why Vader cuz I've always wondered just down deep inside the fanboy in me is always wondered why is it that Darth Vader never really backed the Death Star. I mean, he he's the main villain in New Hope. He should actually be saying I will take this weapon and use it against the galaxy. But Vader is not like he doesn't even want to be there. It's more or less Tarkin and his cronies and his other commanders that believe in the Death Star. And Vader doesn't. What does that say about Vader? At least we we hope they stick to that. Yeah. Because that was the original idea. That was the original idea. And I'm like going, it makes sense that basically, yeah, Vader, what, what is Vader's motivations against the Death Star? If you found out that basically the, the Death Star literally is being powered by a religious relic that he believes in, he might not take that too kindly. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know what? We need to go to a very quick break, Dave. And then when we come back, we're going to jump into the rest of the Rogue One news. Don't go nowhere. loved ones but don't let that stop you death is not the end here at i have the power to save the ones you love we can all get back a dead loved one just listen to one of our happy customers well since high school i had a crush on tabby antilles but she married jet sloan the varsity pod racing champion last year she died in a shuttle accident sloan had given up and bury her remains at the Twin Moisture Evaporator Cemetery here on Tatooine. He never really loved her, not as much as I did, and do. Now, not much of Tabby was left after the shuttle incident, but that's okay. All we need is a leg, an arm, etc. to bring back the one you love. So one night, I snuck into the cemetery, and I unearthed her decomposing body and took them right over to I have the power to save the one you love. Thanks to the exclusive deal we set up with Emperor Palpatine, we were able to bring back Tabby, and we can do the same for you. Call now for your free consultation. Hollow net number 777, save the one you love. I was so happy. I knew that because I brought Tabby back to life, she'd love me and not Sloan. And boy, was I right. Oh, yes! I have the power to save the one you love! This message is approved by the Galactic Empire. We did it! (laughs) Hello, Rain Man Digital listeners. The new Rain Man Digital app is now available in the Google Play Store. You can now take the entire Rain Man Digital Network on the go, anywhere you want to go, on your Android-based device. Whether you want to listen to Supernatural, The Crossroads, The Rain Man Show, Critique Revolve, Weird West Radio, or Star Wars From the Back to Tank, it doesn't matter. You can take all those shows now on any Android device. So go to the Google Play Store and search Rain Man Digital and download the free app today. The app will also be available very soon for iPhones. So keep checking in. The 
the Force is with you, young Skywalker. But you are not a Jedi yet. You're listening to From the Back to Tank on Rayman. Everybody, welcome back. If you're listening on the app or tune in, uh, you can also join in a chat room, I guess. I guess I, I forget we have a chat room that's always open. <laughs> so if you go to RaymanDigitalMedia.com and click on the Listen Live RM Channel 001, there is a chat room open. If you want to go in and talk to us, give us uh, some insight or disagree with us. Or spam the heck out of us. Yes, or if you know of any Jen Usho uh, <laughs> fan fiction out there, I'll be uh, please share that. Also, you can tweet us at from back to tank as well as facebook.com slash from the back to tank. Talk to us. Let us know how you enjoy the show. All right, so getting into this Jen Ursel stuff for a second, and I'm trying to fix it up by saying Ursel because that's not how you say <laughs> so. it. Uh, back in... I'm going to give some people some background on this because as I said last show, our, um, our listenership has like Spiked. multiplied by like 20 and, uh, I'm, try, I'm trying to, SO. I'm trying to pinpoint it, but I'm sure many listeners have missed if they did not go back and listen, they've missed the whole Ursul asshole bit, um, that happened. I want to say in June or May during star Wars celebration, um, the reason why we keep saying Jen Asso is because that's how you pronounce it, apparently. And we made a joke because, and we all know that most of, oh, many of the Star Wars characters all speak with the British accent. So why would you name a character Ursel when it sounds so close to asshole? <laughs> and if you don't, if you think I'm exaggerating, I'm not. David pulled up the audio from the Star Wars Celebration because uh, people were asking about it. So this is where it's from. And if you hear something differently, please tell me. Because I certainly don't. I don't either. Here it is right here. It, it's a 28 second mark. Yes. Goodness. Goodness. This is Gwendolyn Christie um, introducing Felicity Jones at the Star Wars Celebration. And showing her her yeah. new figure. Yeah. Is your Jin Urso action figure? <laughs> oh. Go ahead, play it again. Play it again. Hold on. <laughs> I don't. I don't know how anyone else. Can even, you can't disagree with us anymore. Okay, here it is. Goodness. Here is your Jin Urso action <laughs> figure. Asho. It's uh, oh. asho. Yeah. Asho. It's it's asshole. He's an asshole. <laughs> Jin Urso action figure. Oh, there's got to be a bit. I got to do a bit on this. I have to make... I, we don't have a lot of time anymore to do Star Wars bits, but I'm going to make a parody with this. I, I just have to think of one because it's just, it writes itself. Because and the best part by far is everyone just acts, oh, oh, that's so great. Yeah, you know, there's got to be some Americans out there like, are we asshole? <laughs> I can't say anything. This I'm surrounded by people. Wait, wait, wait. There's a Jin asshole has an action figure? Her actual asshole? <laughs> <laughs> because. Goodness. Goodness. Here is your Jin Urso action figure. Yes, look at that asshole. Goodness. Thank you very much. Donnie Yen is like sitting next to her. He's like, mm, that's a nice asshole. <laughs> <laughs> asshole. Nice small asshole. <laughs> oh my God, the bit writes itself. I know. Oh man. Uh, Jen looks at Donnie, quit staring at my asshole. <laughs> very much. I feel very privileged. <laughs> it's totally. It just writes itself. I yeah. Swear. Oh, I love it. All right. So, since we're on the whole Rogue One kit, uh, kick here, Rogue One's world premiere has also been set uh, a month away from the release, pretty much uh, for the entire world. But the world premiere is set for December 10th. It's going to be a busy Christmas time. They're keeping it a secret, meaning they have not released where 
it will be released in terms of whether it be LA or uh, London. But I think it's pointing in the direction that it's going to be over. It's going to be another European uh, premiere because I believe episode 10 or episode, episode 10. Have we got there yet? <laughs> episode seven was also released in Europe, correct? Yes. It was released in Germany. No, not Germany. Was it? I, I, I'm trying to remember it, but I know it was in Europe. I know it was in Europe that it was either Germany or England. Huh. The Germans get it. The Germans. Dude, the, the Germans, the Star Wars in Germany is huge. Like, yeah. their Star Wars celebration there was obvi- honestly the biggest. They like being the inspiration for death and destruction. Yes. Yeah, I like how George Lucas used the entire culture to uh, <laughs> demoralize, us. demoralize us. Well, you know, we, we did create Nazis, so I mean, eh. Touche. Lucas. Hey, we're heroes again. <laughs> oh, it's bad. So, uh, yeah, world premiere set for December 10th. So expect lots and lots and lots of reviews to start coming out that time. Because Force Awakens reviews started coming out, what, two weeks before the everyone else got to see the movie? Because uh, there, no, no. there wasn't really an embargo. Usually outlets will have an embargo by the production company, yeah, but it was like once that, they saw it, the reviews came flying out. Well, could, uh, uh, when when I saw it, I forgot when I uh, could release the review that I had to write. Because it was it was when, it was only days before the premiere. It was only days before the premiere. Yeah, because that's we're a smaller outlet, so we um, us and you know along with the rest of Arizona, we were only able to review it when we got it, which was, I think our screening uh, privileges was, I want to say five days before the premiere. No, it was longer than that because I remember I had to actually keep my mouth shut for about like at least two weeks. No, well, you didn't see it that early, Dave. Yeah. I, I even remember that because my girlfriend even mentioned it last night. Really? When we were talking about Star Wars, it was like, it was, it was a while that I had to keep my mouth shut. Interesting. Well, I, eh, well, We'll see. Hopefully we get it early then. You and I, because this year I will be attending with you. Yes. Because I, last year I, I didn't want to wait, see this. but this year I'm not. I'm, I'm anxious to see Jen Asho. <laughs> Very anxious. Uh, okay, Rogue One won't have an opening crawl after all. Now, I think that's a mistake. Really? I'm just, I'm just going to say it. Why? I'll tell you why, okay? It is the... I understand this has never been done before, a standalone movie. But we cannot yeah. forget the heart and soul of Star Wars. You can do a war movie, okay? I know they're trying to do different things. As we hear, each uh, anthology film will have a different like style. But it's still in the Star Wars universe. But I don't want them to forego the main inspiration of Star Wars. And the main inspiration, among many, there's been many sources of inspiration for George Lucas... But the crawl has been stated by Lucas time and time again to be inspired by um, each episode of his has been inspired by the original Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers film film serials. The serials of the time had those crawls. And I think if you forgo them, you forgo the inspirations that that inspired Star Wars. But here's the thing, though, the the caveat to that, though, is like. I mean, the, in recent times, Clone Wars and Rebels, I think, forgo the, the crawl as well. Clone Wars didn't. Clone Wars had the crawl. They didn't use the crawl, but they used the yucky introduction that replaced the crawl, which is yes. also was used by the serials. The over the top. And here comes on the 1945, the yes. Germans have attacked. <laughs> like they do that with the Clone Wars. Yeah. And they, so they so they basically got rid of the crawl, but opened it up with a narration that was very similar to the serials as well. Uh, Rebels, yes, has forgone it, and I'm forgone it, forgone it, forgone it, for- How about just disposed of it. Yes, we'll just go with that. Um, because for whatever reasons, the show's 30 minutes. Who knows? Maybe they didn't want to copy Clone Wars with the narration. Either way, yes, they did get rid of it. Now, now I do understand your point because I remember when they did, uh, when we went to go see uh, Rebels premiere on the movie screens, and they just had no crawl. It just started with Ezra. It did kind of take away a little bit. I, I don't did. know. I mean, I, I understand these show these are different, and I'm 100 percent behind them being different. I don't want them to be the same. Yeah. Why are we going to do standalone films if they're going to be the exact same thing as the episodes? But there's certain things that we can't get rid of, and that's you know Cin- cinematically. Yeah, exactly. Cinematically, there's decisions that you got to stick with. Otherwise, it's not Star Wars. You, you want to maintain the the universal. Um, I guess, um, symmetry. You got to maintain that balance. And I think if you do away with certain things, 
I, I think it's going to kind of diminish what Star Wars is. Yeah. And I, I understand that. I understand why a lot of fans are kind of up in arms in it. The only thing that I was like, on the flip side of it, I was going on the flip side because at this point, I've seen two major series of Star Wars, like Clone Wars, like what you said. They, for, they, they did it differently. Right. They didn't do the crawl. Rebels doesn't do the crawl. So at this point, just be, I think it's because I've watched Clone Wars and Rebels for so long that I've kind of gotten away from the uh, the opening crawl. But for like Star Wars fans that are in the mainstream that don't watch those things, it's I a, understand that it would, it would be a mistake. It's a mistake. It's a mistake on many levels. Uh, for example, you don't need to say episode. Obviously, it's not an episode. But I think it's a mistake, man, especially because you're asking audiences, and this goes back to our discussion we've had since day one when Rogue One was first spoken about and released. The information was released on it. Uh, people are confused. I, I did an experiment with my family and asked around and said, hey, w- w- are you looking forward to Rogue One? You saw the preview, right? Yeah, I'm really interested in seeing what happens with Ray's character and find out if she's Jedi or not. I'm like, oh, wait, wait, that's episode eight. Well, what's this? This is Rogue One. This is different. I don't understand. And I, my whole family was confused. And they're Star Wars people, but they don't, they're not like us. They're not reading books, comics, reading the news on the internet, and following every piece of information. They're the, they represent the average audiences. And we have to remember that the, the $20 billion that Disney wants to make on Rogue One is not coming from the Star Wars elite. No. It needs to encompass the entire world, which are casual moviegoers who go out and see every Star Wars movie because they enjoy Star Wars flick every couple years when they come out or every 10 years. Um, so when you go to the movie and you sit down, you're seeing a Star Wars movie. We already have the confusion of Rogue One. What is it to a lot of people? Okay. Yeah. Number two, they can they can offset that by having a crawl saying Star Wars, a standalone film, but da done on the screen, and then you explain the story and where it's at. That, it, just yeah. like Episode Seven does, and Episode uh, Four, Five, Six, One, Two, Three, they all have they kind of clue you in on what the landscape is of this story era. And I think Rogue One could benefit from having a crawl, not forget the, the inspirations of Flash Gordon and Buck Rogers for a moment and staying true to what Lucas laid out, but also just the fact that it will help clue in audiences who are going to go in confused. Yes. I, 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 when you put it in that regard, I could see the importance of the crawl. I guess, I guess the, the ultimate question is, like, who's it going to hurt most, the hardcore fan or the mainstream fan? Mainstream. Yeah. Who cares about the hardcore fan? And I am one of them. Yeah. You know, I, 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 screw, forget about me because I'm going to go see it. I'm going to enjoy it. As long as you care about telling a good story, I'm going to enjoy the movie. But I also want, I don't want to have to get on the internet and defend the prequels again all over. <laughs> you know, yeah. I, I've been, you know, you know what I mean? Like, I, yeah. don't, I don't want to feel like I'm always defending certain things to the mainstream who don't, who don't, uh, who doesn't understand what we watched. Yeah. You know, and I don't want to have to sit there and, and, and defend Star Wars to people like, what did I just watch? I don't get it. I'm confused. Just do, Lucasfilm has done nothing, nothing to help explain what Rogue One is. They, they're, they're, they're accepting the fact that people are smart enough to understand. They're not. People are not smart. People don't pay attention. Majority of the population is dumb. They're not going to know what they're watching. And I think now they're doing away with their crawl. I think you're going to have completely people completely baffled. I think it's a mistake. I'm yeah. saying it now. November 19th. I hate to say it, too. I mean, in... Uh... Uh, one of the interviews, Kennedy even said it herself. That, I mean, like in the article that you posted up uh, in June, Kennedy said the crawl and some of those elements live so specifically, 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 Jesus. Sorry, within the what saga films <laughs> that we ha- are having a lot of discussion about what will define the standalone Star Wars stories separate and apart from the saga films. So we're right in the middle of talking about it. Yeah, Kathleen Kennedy, you know, thank you for telling us this, but nobody is looking up this interview with you on Collider.com or StarWars.com except us, the yeah. Star Wars elite. Normal Joes that are going to go see your movie are not, eh, I'm going to StarWars.com. Yeah. Oh, interesting news, Kathleen Kennedy. Thank you for sharing it. They're not going to know. And they're not going to know. They're not going to understand that basically, oh, it's a standalone film without you telling them. They're going to think that's part of the title. Star Wars standalone. 
Not the title of this movie? <laughs> Can I get two tickets for Star Wars standalone, standalone. please? And that just doesn't sound right. You, Star I mean, Wars standalone. <laughs> You're gonna have people if that's on the title, dude. That'd be amazing. It's like Star oh Wars, my God. A, star, a, standalone a standalone film. film. I don't think it's going. I think it's gonna say a Star Wars film. I think that's what it says. But dude, if someone ordered a stay. Can I get two standalone? What? <laughs> what? What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> Sit down. Yeah. All right. Let's move into some more George Lucas inspired news um, because he cannot leave. <laughs> well, and I, I don't want him to leave. And this is crucial, yeah. man. And this is something that I think you and I can definitely agree on is um, George Lucas's importance to the star Wars universe here now and forever. Um, and this article will shed some light on this. Okay. Yes. Now George Lucas will always remain at the forefront of directors minds. Okay. At least right now. Okay. According to a recent interview with uh, Rogue One's director, he states that George Lucas, I, we already talked about this briefly, um, but he expounded on his thoughts when George, Lu- George Lucas visited the set of Rogue One. Obviously, he was nervous. He was uh, look- excited that George Lucas, his, his, uh, you know, a god figure to many would-be directors in the 80s and 90s when they're growing up, you know, they want to be George Lucas. They want to make Star Wars movies. Their dream is to do it. And now they're doing it. Many of these directors are actually w- doing the dream job they thought of. Many of filmmakers, including ourselves, Dave, got into making movies because of these types of films. Yes. So absolutely. you have George Lucas going on set. And apparently, yes, he didn't have, you know, creative say George Lucas. He no longer has that. Um, but he did visit and shared with Edwards Gareth Edwards, the stuff he really liked and then kind of brushed off the things he didn't really care for. And Gareth listened to him, even though he didn't have to. And George wasn't there to tell him to change things. He was just sharing his thoughts and what he thought of, of which things he enjoyed and everything he enjoyed. Gareth kept everything George didn't mention on. He kept out. Which I think is kind of interesting because I think it's smart to do this. George knows whether we agree with his stories, his actual writing, that's regardless. That, that, that's not the point. I think we've all can agree that George Lucas isn't the greatest writer. Yes. But as a story man, as an idea man, as an idea man, the guy's a genius. As an absolute Leonardo da Vinci. Yeah. And, and his thoughts have, have resonated in the hearts and minds of millions of filmmakers around the world. And uh, maybe not millions, but hundreds of thousands of filmmakers around the world. And the point of this discussion is not about Gareth Edwards necessarily, but it's about how long can we say this is going to be? Meaning right now, Star Wars is in the hands of fans, right? Yeah. Well, kind of. They are. Kind of. Kathleen Kennedy is a big fan and advocate of George Lucas. Yes. Dave she, Filoni. She is the protege of Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. Yes. She is made by them. So having her control Lucasfilm, I was fine when they announced that she'd be taking over. She gets it. She's been around since day one. Um, but then you have Dave Filoni. You have Gareth Edwards. You have the, the J. J. Uh, Lawrence Kasdan knows yeah. what he's doing for the Han Solo movie. He's not a fan boy, but he was around and worked with George Lucas. He wrote Empire Strikes Back. So, so far, all the new avenues, J.J. Abrams, big fan of Spielberg and George Lucas, wanted nothing more than to please them. Yes. Uh, and I think in a lot of ways, because of that, they're holding on to what made Star Wars Star Wars. They're holding on to the Lucas era in a lot of ways. Yes. But and so far it's worked. But eventually Kasdan's going to die. Eventually, you know, heaven forbid, he will die. He's old. Eventually Kasdan will retire. Eventually. These directors in 10 years, we're going to have directors from the prequel era. People who may not have eh, Star Wars. What? care about this movie I'm, yeah. being, I'm being i've never really cared about star wars before i'm just hired think about that in 10 15 years from now when they're still making star wars movies eventually the respect for george lucas will not be there oh yeah absolutely and once that happens are we going to see star wars change in what it is that's the thing i'm really worried about because when you think about it look what happened to star trek that's happened to star trek yeah i mean a little bit not not too bad, but yeah. When I Roddenberry agree. when Roddenberry left, oh and well, yeah, we were talking way back. Gone. 
Uh, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a no show. Yeah, no. I mean, he has his proteges working on. They stayed on board. I think eventually down the road they just got got, got lazy. When you're yeah. talking about Star Trek, but for the most part, they were able to carry on his torch for many, many, many years. For many years, but down the line, I mean, even with it the got new, watered down. It got watered down, and it's nothing like it was back in the day. I agree, and. Honestly, yeah, the, I do see that happening in the Star Wars, especially, I hate to say it, I mean, for example, I just clicked on the comments and everything on this article, majority of people are complaining about his influence on this. And they're stupid. And yeah, and they're, but they're, here's they're the thing. They're complaining about the influence because they don't get what they like. Yeah. They don't understand it. And here's the thing. That's the majority of the people, though. That's uh, I'm, I'm sorry. That's like fans. That's the fans. And it's down the line, they they're going to take it. over. Exactly. That's a good point. But like, they don't get it though. Like they, they don't get it. They're disliking George Lucas, but like you realize that everything about star Wars is George Lucas. You can hate on him for his, for his prequels if you want, but his choices, but you know what? There's a reason why star Wars has held on and captivated the minds of fans across the world for decades. It's not because how many, and I've said this before and I want to, I want to stress it again for this point. Many, how many movies, seventies sci-fi films came out, in the 70s, 80s. Dozens. Dozens yeah. and dozens. And how many are remembered? Exactly. Star, yeah. There's a reason why Star Wars has remained at the top of people's minds for decades. It's because George Lucas has managed to tell a story that's so captivating that it has captivated the minds and hearts of generations of parents and their kids and their kids' parents have all fallen in line and said, man, this is awesome. This is great. But, and you can't replace George Lucas. You can't, you can keep telling his ideas, which is why rebels is so good. Yeah. You don't realize that. Yeah. Dave Filoni is a fantastic writer and his crew is, is great. But the reason why rebels is good is because they're borrowing from, as we talked about in the last rebels episode, they're borrowing from ideas of Lucas and McQuarrie and McQuarrie, things that they decided not to use and they, and they shelved it for the time, but they're using Lucas's ideas. What's going to happen when we're finally out of George Lucas ideas and, or we get people on board who don't give a shit about George Lucas, who don't have that respect or that awe because they didn't grow up watching Star Wars films. Yeah. And it loses that. It, it'll you, lose. You it'll be watered down. It's what I said a long time ago. You can't replace George Lucas with another director. And say, hey guys, it's still going to be the same thing. It's same thing, guys. Same thing. George Lucas is not involved. It's not the same thing. It's not the same thing. But so far, it's working because they're respecting what Lucas has laid out before and borrowing and using similar themes, motifs, and archetypes. Yeah. Once that changes, though, like I said, I think we're going to see a whole different era of Star Wars. And I think in the end, it may end up dying. Yeah. I'm just gonna, I think it's going to end up dying because you can't expect that type of genius isn't, isn't, is rare. It's rare. And it, how, just, it just doesn't pop up again. This, this, the story in the article, how neat is it, dude? Is like... All of a sudden, like they're just walking around the world. I'm, I'm picturing this, like About the, the the helmet Rogue One visit. Yeah. yeah, when he when he's walking around their workshop, and all of a sudden he sees a helmet that they all were saying, "Oh man, this is cool." We don't know how to use it, and Lucas basically says, "Hey, that's kind of a neat. That's a neat helmet. I really like that." Walks away, and all of a sudden they go, "We have to put this in the movie now." Of course, <laughs> and it's, I don't care where it is. Yeah, people that he hate, liked it. People that hate on George Lucas are silly. It's dumb that they're hating on a guy who, like, what are you, why are you watching Star Wars then? If you're going to hate on George Lucas that much. I know. It's it, silly. It's, it's really silly. It's silly. It's really silly to actually, it's like, honestly, if if you're a Star Wars fan, I understand your hate for certain elements of Star Wars, but come to understand you love Star Wars because of George Lucas, because of his ideas, because of his creation. Yeah. You know? All right, we need to switch gears. We're getting way into this, Dave. But yes. uh, we're, and we got to end the show very soon here. Um, all right, last bit, and then we're going to move on and end the show. The official Rogue One prequel book, Catalyst, is out now. It came out November 15th. I think I'm going to pick this one up. It is a... How many times have you said you're going to pick up no, a book? No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start reading it. And, <laughs> and, and, and you're right. You, how many times have I said that I, I keep getting busy and distracted? So what we're going to do to keep me on track, David? Drum roll, please. Um, we're going to do a Star Wars book club type thing. We're going to pick a book and we're going to read it every month. And this will help you stay on track, the listeners, and this will help me stay on track and David and making sure we're reading all the latest comic books and books. We're going to start out with the books first. Comic books, 
I need to eventually start reading those. I haven't. I, I read about two or three issues of every one. Comics, comics take a lot more time than books. Yeah, and and money. I'm like five, six bucks a week. Yeah. I mean, eh. It's better for comic <clears throat> books for you to wait for the trade of the comic yeah. to come out than actually buy every single issue. Buying a book is easier. Yeah, so we're going to do a book club type thing. I'm going to get some details worked out, figure out how we're going to do this. But we're going to pick a book starting next year. Uh, in January when we come back because we're going to we have what maybe two or three more shows before our winter break days yes. so we're going to do two or three more shows between now and December 15th I think and then after that we're going to be on our winter hiatus that we do annually uh, for the holidays and when we come back I think we're going to start the book club then that will help all of us stay on track and once we finish the book after the four week mark we'll sit and discuss it uh, we'll pick some paragraphs out, some elements that we like, maybe some new canon that has been added that we really appreciate, and we'll kind of discuss it, and we'll talk about the ramifications and what it may m- m- mean to the rest of the Star Wars universe and what we may see in the future. Count me in. Um, yeah, because I think it's, it would be fun to do that, because as we know, these books now are officially canon, and uh, the Lucasfilm Story Group will not be adding things that are just for throwaway. That If they put something in there that seems like it's there for a reason, it probably has much, much larger implications for the Star Wars universe. Yeah, and, I, and honestly, dude, I don't say this because I'm a, just a Star Wars fan. I'm a, I, I love reading books. The, bo- the Star Wars books that have been released are good. All been really pretty decent. There's not been a really weak Star Wars story that I could think of. Yeah, you have your mo- yeah, you have your books like say for example the Lego books. Yeah, they're they're yeah, meant for kids. We're not going to read those. Yeah, ones, they're meant for kids, but the the actual novels are really strong. Yeah. Now I have a list here. We're going to go by the timeline of canon books. Okay, we're going to read just the canon books for now, so we can kind of get a bigger picture for our show. Um, and what I think it was just help in discussions as well, having that acts, you know, the, the extra bit of knowledge to, uh, discuss rumors and gossip. Okay. So here we go. Uh, timeline books, the official books starts with uh, original novel, dark disciple, which is a story of Ventress. Yes. Okay. That's the first official book. The next one is, uh, is Ahsoka, which just also came out just last month. Actually, apparently to this one, it's Catalyst. It's not. Uh, they put it there before the update. Oh, okay. Yeah, it doesn't fit there. Because uh, that, would, that would mean... Oh, it, because exact placement currently unknown. Yeah. Okay. So the next book would be Ahsoka. The next one after that is Lords of the Sith, followed by Tarkin. And then the book that I did read, A, a New Dawn, Lost Stars, which is, an, uh, I believe, that's a young kid's book. Which yeah, we're not going to skip that one as well. Uh, Battlefront, Twilight Company. Should we read that? Alfred Twilight Company is actually pretty damn good. Okay, so we'll read that one as well. And then there is, of course, uh, Catalyst, which comes in after that. That comes in right before New Hope. So I think what I'm going to start with, Dave, just because it's relevant right now, is I'm going to actually start with Catalyst. Okay. Okay, then I'm going to read, we're going to go in order. I'm going to read Dark Disciple, followed by Ahsoka and Lords of the Sith. Okay, so I'm going to start with Catalyst. Have you read that yet? No, I haven't read Catalyst yet, but I have read uh, Dark Disciple and uh, Lords of the Sith. Okay, you have not read Ahsoka yet? No. Okay, good. Don't read it yet. Um, All right, so Catalyst is what we'll be reading. I'm going to start today, and then maybe we can even talk about it before Rogue One comes out. Sounds good. And tie it into our review and our discussion when we go see it. So I want to thank everybody for listening today uh, to our broadcast. If you miss any part of the show, you can always find us on Stitcher and iTunes. Just search Star Wars from the back to tank. Also the Rain Man digital app. You can take the entire network. Uh, If you like Supernatural, the TV show, Arrow, the Flash, um, Legends of Tomorrow, Supergirl. If you like Western films, uh, if you like comedy, political satire with a lot of foul language, we have it all. We, if you're a geek, you should be listening to or us. deviant or deviant. Yeah, yes. you're a geeky deviant. Geeky I think deviant. You need to be having this. This is the network for you, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> All right, thank you, everybody. May the force be with you. Hello, this is Stormtrooper One, and if you've missed any portion of the show, you can always head over to FromTheBackToTank.com and uh, listen to the show at your leisure. Uh, we're also on Stitcher, Smart Radio, Stitcher.com, search BACTA, and add us to your favorites. Thank you. And uh, listen responsibly. And may the Force be with you. And long live. Thank you for listening to.
from the Back to Take. And from the Back to Take is executive produced by Michael Flores and Dustin Lucas. Hosted by Michael Flores, David Zabal. You can find out more about our show by going to www.fromthebacktotake.com. You can also find us on Twitter at From Back to Take. As well as Facebook. Facebook.com slash From the Back to Take. 